So starting with the first question, what causes high blood pressure? If your answer is stress, that would be correct, right? <laughs> but we got to quantify what we mean by stress, right? In the scientific terms, stress is simply oxidative stress. Oxidative stress means damage to your cells. And it could be a variety of things that cause damage to your cells. It could be a lack of oxygen. It could be toxins, things of that nature, right? So oxidative stress to your cells, any of the cells in your body, cells in your brain, cells throughout your vascular system, tissue cells, whatever the case is, just overall broad-based oxidative stress. And then your body responds to that oxidative stress with what we call inflammation, right? So step number one, oxidative stress, your body responds with step number two, inflammation. One of the common forms of inflammation is vascular constriction. And that vascular constriction is what we know as high blood pressure. Pretty simple, right? So let's take something people very commonly deal with, caffeine. Now caffeine, if taken long enough and high enough dosages, uh, can lead to inflammation because of a buildup of a, of a, 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 desensis, a desensitization. I hope I'm saying that word correctly, but pretty much you get desensitized uh, to the caffeine. You build up a resistance to it. And if you miss a day without that caffeine, you can develop lethargia, headaches, things of this nature. Right? It's an inflammatory response. And one of the things that come along with that lethargia and the headache is high blood pressure, vascular constriction. So uh, when people ask me, hey, how do you feel about coffee? Well, generally speaking, um, it's, not, it's not one of the worst things you can drink, but I typically recommend against it or an alternative to it, which is like a tea. Um, Dealing with caffeine withdrawals is not really a thing you got to worry about when you're getting your caffeine from things like green tea or white tea, things of this nature, chai tea, stuff like that, right? So that's a better way to go, especially if you're trying to wean off of caffeine. So let's say you've been drinking a lot of coffee, you may want to switch to tea. So you're not cutting the caffeine cold turkey and then ending up with the high pressure and the headaches and things like that, but you're tapering down. So that's one of the things that can help you with your blood pressure. It's not the only thing, but it's part of it, right? So switching over to that tea. So let's say you do green tea and green tea has a variety of different antioxidants in it, which helps to reduce stress. And that can go a long way uh, towards improving your blood pressure, right? Then you have other things. The, uh, I'd probably say poor sleep quality. Typically, people who have poor sleep quality tend to have caffeine addictions. So these things uh, go hand in hand. So one of the best things that you can do, if not the best thing that you can do for your blood pressure, is to improve your sleep quality. I've had people who struggle with their blood pressure. They're doing everything right. Their diet is solid and everything like that. But the one key component that's missing is the sleep quality, right? So if you're getting poor sleep quality, then you, you, you end up using things like caffeine, for example, or stimulants in order to get energy. So now if you're adding exercise on top of that, well, there's a cost to pay with that. And over time, this can really eat into your brain chemistry. So every action that you take requires some sort of payment in your body. So for example, the currencies of life are things like serotonin, dopamine, magnesium, zinc, vitamin C, B vitamins. All of these different micronutrients and hormones and things like that are forms of currency in the body. And if you're lacking sleep, you then have to compensate by paying extra in these other forms of currency. See, the sleep is the thing that gives you more of life's currency. But if you're not getting the sleep, well, eventually uh, you get a bankruptcy of that currency of life. 
So, how do you improve your sleep quality? Well, they can be things like your eating schedule. When you wake up first thing in the morning, I would say to start eating an hour to two hours after you wake up. And then finish eating four to six hours before bed. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is they eat too close to bedtime. Okay. Eating too close to bedtime ramps up your metabolism. And so your body is in between two modes. You're either in digestion or recovery. When you get into digestion, digestion interferes with your body's processes of falling into a deep sleep. You're not really supposed to be in the middle of digestion when you're trying to go to sleep, right? So you want to get the bulk of the digestion in, or at least half the digestion in before it's time to go to bed, right? So digestion should be curving down. Your blood sugar level should be curving down, right? As you get into your sleep, all right? And the reason for that is because the nutrients from your food is the thing that your body uses into synthesizing new hormones and things like that in order to drive you into a nice deep sleep, right? So it's a scheduling conflict pretty much. So when you, when you stop eating four to six hours before bed, your blood sugar levels come down, your body calms down, everything calms down and you're, you're more effectively able to slide into a deeper sleep by doing that. There's habits, um, the little things that you can do. So for example, with your last meal, you have ginger tea. Let's say you have a quarter teaspoon or a half teaspoon of ginger powder and eight to 10 ounces of water before bed. Or you do hibiscus tea before bed, right? Something like that. Or with your last meal. And this is calming for your gut, right? So this is a gut health thing easing digestion, hydrating your body, things like that with the last meal. Blood sugar control is extremely important for getting into a deep sleep. Now, some people, they'll eat something really heavy and they get into the itis, right? Where your blood sugar spikes up and you get into this, this sugar coma and you just slump down. Now, you can kind of go to sleep doing that, but it's not like a deep sleep. Not really. It's not like a healthy sleep you want to do. It's because that's the type of sleep you get from your parasympathetic nervous system shutting you down to bring your blood sugar down. Right? It's a survival mechanism, pretty much. That's that crash that you get, right? So you don't want to you don't want to go to sleep from a from a crash due to let's say insulin resistance or poor eating habits, right? Um, so let's say you stop eating four to six hours before bed and then an hour before bed, you can then drink magnesium glycinate, which is magnesium bound to glycine, right? Um, this is one of the, this is one of the major supplements that I tell people to supplement with, right? Magnesium in general. It can be different types of magnesium, but particularly to improve sleep quality, magnesium glycinate. Glycine in and of itself is an amino acid that helps to calm the body down. It's great for anxiety, depression, balancing uh, brain chemistry, getting more serotonin and dopamine production, things of that nature, right? But the magnesium, when it's paired and bound to the magnesium, you also get the benefits of the magnesium, right? So when you pair them together, this is, it's, this is called a chelated form of magnesium. So any mineral has to be bound to an organic substance in order for it to be optimally uh, absorbed into your body, right? So you can raise uh, your serum levels of your magnesium or the level of magnesium that's in your blood and the level of magnesium that goes into your lean tissue, muscle, bone, all of that type of stuff, brain, etc. right? Magnesium glycinate, there's a lot of research on it. It shows the efficacy of it, right? So that's like, uh, that's number one on my list there. So, let's say you take 12 ounces of water, you got your magnesium glycinate, and then you take, let's say, 30 milligrams of, let's say, zinc picolinate. Zinc is also a very important mineral um, that is needed to get into a good deep sleep 
And what I'm talking about is deep sleep, REM sleep, right? Where you're getting in like an hour, hour and a half, two hours, three hours of deep sleep, REM sleep, right? Which is where you get the real deep recovery. This is where the reversal of chronic illness really happens. This is where your blood pressure really gets fixed and regulated. It's in that deep sleep, right? So if you're having dreams, that's how you know you're in that REM sleep. You're getting some really good sleep, deep, right? So when you when you pair magnesium and zinc together, this is very important because zinc is is really one of those minerals as the backbone of your immune system. If you want to really re regulate your immune system, in other words, you don't want your immune system to be overactive or underactive. You want to balance it. Zinc is very important for that. And zinc pairs very nicely with magnesium in order to put you into a deep sleep and really rebalance and improve your brain chemistry. Very important stuff. Zinc is important for optimal testosterone, estrogen levels, serotonin, dopamine, endorphins, insulin, all of that, right? All of the hormones in your body in large part are regulated by these two minerals. So those two things are really good uh, for improving sleep quality as supplementation before bed and then ending eating earlier. It's also good for your overall body fat percentage, BMI, and all that kind of stuff, right? Because that, you know, ending eating at a decent time is extremely beneficial for improving um, body fat burn, weight management, weight loss, etc. In the mornings, supplementing with B-complex, vitamin D3, chromium picolinate these are three major supplements that are also very important for improving um your blood pressure reducing that oxidative stress because i'm still talking about stress management here largely right so just talking about the easiest parts which are the supplementation if you have an overactive thyroid hyperthyroidism or an underactive thyroid, hypothyroidism. This can result in high blood pressure as well and also high cholesterol, right? With vitamin D, and the suggestion in general would be like um, 5,000 to 10,000 IUs of vitamin D per day. Uh, on record, 40% of the, of the population um, has a deficiency in vitamin D. I think that number is massively un underreported. Um, most of the people that I work with that I've come across that are dealing with a chronic illness are vitamin D deficient as well as magnesium deficient. As far as dosages, um, you should be getting at least 7 to 10 milligrams of zinc per day. If you're a man, it should be around 10. If you're a woman, it should be around 7. But women and men should be getting a minimum of 420 milligrams of magnesium per day. And as far as the vitamin D, it should be 5,000 IUs, right? Um, so vitamin D3 supplementation. Massive game changer. In a variety of ways. This helps to balance your thyroid production your liver function right this will also uh go a long way towards correcting cholesterol levels so lowering your cholesterol is not it's not really the goal what the goal really is is to correct your cholesterol levels essentially when people have high cholesterol it's often because they have high LDL, right? Low density lipids, what are associated with the negative effects of cholesterol, right? Those low density lipids. Uh, SD LDL, small dense, low density lipids, right? Um, oxidized cholesterol, right? Cholesterol that um, is the basis for atherosclerosis, right? Atherosclerotic plaque buildup. Uh, that LDL is the LDL or the, the, the lipids, the lipoproteins um, that get lodged in inside uh, damaged uh, arteries and blood vessels. And they can burst over time, right? right? And that would cause things like stroke, 
an aneurysm, things of this nature, right? Um, as a result of that rupture. High blood pressure is the indication that that could possibly uh, be in the process of developing in, in, in your vascular system, right? Um, vitamin D is very important for uh, correcting your cholesterol levels by lowering LDL and raising your HDL. Uh, people with uh, high cholesterol, excessively high cholesterol, like cholesterol that's like well over 200, right? um, when they lower their LDL below 80, right, getting it to around 70, which is an I, which is an ideal level. As the LDL comes down, the HDL, right, the high density lipids comes up, right. That's what I'm talking about. That rebalancing or correcting uh, the ratio of the cholesterol. That's also very important for calcium absorption into bone tissue. So a lot of the times too, with people who have osteodegenerative uh, diseases also have high blood pressure, right? Um, so if you take a blood test, you may have some type of osteodegenerative disease along with high blood calcium, along with atherosclerotic plaque buildup along with a narrowing of the arteries, which is driving up blood pressure. And vitamin D goes a long way towards reversing that. Not on its own, but it's a big part of it. So that vitamin D works with the magnesium and the zinc to improve the absorption of calcium into your bone. A lot of people, they don't actually lack calcium. They get plenty of calcium from their diet. The problem is that calcium it's not being absorbed into the bone, it's floating around in the bloodstream, and then it's being combined with lipoproteins and developing plaques, uh, plaques, plaques um, that end up building up on the surface of the brain, around the arteries, that type of thing. Right? So I usually don't recommend for people to supplement with calcium because it's not really a thing that people have much of a deficit in. So you got the vitamin D works with the magnesium, works with the zinc together, right? And they largely all work together to regulate liver function, which is important for regulating testosterone, uh, estrogen, T3, T4, uh, and that trickles up to the thyroid and into the pituitary gland to regulate a thyroid stimulating hormone that is released from the pituitary. So let's say you have hypothyroidism and that means that you, you know, you have a, a lack of T3 production in your body. You may have an excessive amount of T4 and a poor conversion into T3. That's a liver issue. Chances are that's a result of the low magnesium and the vitamin D. Most people, especially people with chronic illnesses, lack the magnesium and the vitamin D. So those things work together to improve T3 in the liver. This is important because of glucose management. Now, we're kind of working backwards here, but the reason why this is important is because your blood sugar, insulin sensitivity, and blood pressure are directly correlated. When you have chronically high blood sugar as a result of being insulin resistant, this causes vascular constriction, right? A narrowing of the arteries. So you get all this blood, uh, blood glucose, and then you get a constriction as a result because this is an inflammatory reaction. When you improve insulin sensitivity, and insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity are a measure of how effective your, your lean tissue cells are able to absorb glucose and use them for energy. Insulin resistance means that your body doesn't do a great job of getting that glucose into your lean tissue cells. Insulin sensitivity means your body does a great job of it, right? And insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity exist on a scale, right? So when you have adequate amounts of vitamin D, you have adequate amounts of magnesium, you have adequate amounts of zinc, that goes a long way towards improving thyroid hormones, specifically T3 production. T3 is needed 
in order for you, for the mitochondria, which are the energy producing factories in your cells, to convert glucose into usable energy. When your cells get better at converting glucose into available into available energy, that results in an increase of glucose uptake. See, when your cells are, don't do a great job of taking on glucose to use for energy, they're less likely to bring in more glucose to use for energy because it's having difficulty with the with, with the energy buildup it already has. So, improving that that um, gluco that that glucose conversion into ATP, which is called adenosine triphosphate, right, which is the energy molecule that, that is created um, in the cells. The more energy production is created, the more glucose uptake happens in your cells, right? And this goes a long way to improving insulin sensitivity and bringing your blood sugar down to stable, uh, good levels. And this also results in uh, the reversal of vascular constriction. This removes the inflammatory response to the high blood, uh, high blood sugar, right? So the T3 facilitates that whole energy conversion process, right? So if you got low T3, you're not really uh, having an abundance of energy. So a lot of people with hypothyroidism, they come to me, they're fatigued, tired, they always tired all the time, never really have any energy. Uh, they take, they're taking levothyroxine, that kind of thing, right? Hormone medication, some type of hormone uh, treatment to make up for the lack of T3. When in actually, what in actuality, what they really need to do is stimulate the conversion of T3 to T4, right? Now I mentioned B complex or B12. Now what you would do when you supplement with B12 is you would get that B12 along with other B vitamins. So this would be this would come along with your B1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, right? B1 through 9 and B12, right? So all of the B vitamins work together uh, to stimulate healthy nervous system function and energy conversion, fat metabolism, as well as glucose metabolism, right? Um, so that's the purpose of uh, the supplementing with the, with the B vitamins. A lot of people who struggle with energy production and obesity often lack B12 or lack some type of B vitamins, or maybe lack B1, maybe lack B6, B3, B9. These are the ones that usually people lack the most, right, is the ones that I just mentioned. Um, so when you supplement with those, and you know, pretty, most B, B supplements come with an abundance, uh, like a very high dosage of B vitamins, right? B vitamins are not really expensive at all, they're water soluble, so they don't really build up to a toxic degree in your body. So we've got B complex, vitamin D, magnesium, zinc, right? And these all work together to facilitate um, an adequate amount of energy production and sleep quality. And in order for in order to get the energy production, you need the sleep quality. And then in order to get the sleep quality, you need the energy production, right? So these supplements work together to cover both ends. Right, because you, you have to address both at the same time. Right. Then I mentioned chromium picolinate, right? And chromium picolinate is a type of supplement, right? Uh, of chromium, which is a trace mineral. Um, it stays in the body for a pretty long period of time, but you can run a deficit of this stuff, especially with people who struggle with uh, obesity and thyroid issues. Whether you got hypo or hyperthyroid, right? You can be lacking chromium, the necessary chromium. So, like, the same treatment that you would have for hypothyroidism is the same treatment you would have for hyperthyroidism. Because the goal isn't to increase or decrease. The goal, really, is to regulate. And your body does that on its own, right? So you don't manually facilitate how much or how little of something your body produces. It does it on its own. Right? So you give your body the necessary vitamins and minerals and your body just does it on its own. It'll regulate the levels on its own. It's phenomenal. Right? So like even like a, a let's say you have a man with low testosterone, 
or a woman with low estrogen. You can follow the same strategy with both and then see an improvement in estrogen levels in the woman and improvement in testosterone levels in the men. It's phenomenal, right? It's the same approach. I would say that the main difference is because, well, women, you have a uterus and ovaries and a man, you have testicles, right? So <laughs> your body with these particular organs and parts will just work their own magic and make their own levels, right? Uh, so that's pretty much how it works. You can't really, it, so, you know, you think as a woman, well, zinc raises testosterone, so maybe I shouldn't take zinc. And it's like, well, you don't have the necessary parts to overproduce testosterone. Um, in that kind of pathological way, right? You don't have the parts. You're getting all your testosterone from your adrenal glands, right? Um, and if you're having issues with your adrenal glands and testosterone and estrogen, you have to regulate those things. Now, as far as the B-complex, one thing I'm a really big fan of, it's kind of expensive, but I'm a very big fan of a food-based B-complex. It's called Vital. And I suggest this to a lot of the people that I work with, right? All my tribe members. And this Flora Vital, it's a food based um, B complex slash iron slash copper supplement, which is phenomenal too, because when you're supplementing with that iron and that copper, it works to balance out the supplementation of the zinc that you do at the end of the day, right? Because zinc and copper are codependent. So you can't have disproportionate levels of zinc compared to copper because that'll create health issues. Right. Um, as well as magnesium and calcium, right? They have a codependent relationship. If calcium is excessively high compared to magnesium, you could end up having an excessive level of calcium in your blood and you can cause a leaching of calcium from your bone tissue, right? And that can contribute to heart disease and high blood pressure. Some people are actually taking um, a calcium supplement, and then that ends up resulting uh, in high blood pressure. This makes their atherosclerosis and kidney issues and everything way worse. I haven't even gotten into the kidney issues yet. That's a different thing. So with the chromium, chromium works as a trace mineral to signal to your pituitary gland, your adrenal glands, and your thyroid what to do. Right? It's a communication mechanism. Right. Um, and so that's why it's so important to take in the beginning of the day, typically with your first meal, along with your vitamin D and your B complex. Uh, this also, these things combined together, go a really long way to managing your blood sugar throughout the entire day. So if you're type two diabetic, you're pre-diabetic, insulin resistant, whatever the case is, these supplements in the beginning of your day will get you off to the right foot as far as reversing type two diabetes. And as you become more insulin sensitive, your blood, your blood pressure will begin to regulate along with your blood sugar levels, right? So essentially I'm talking right now about high blood pressure in reference to the metabolic disorders that control energy production, as well as blood sugar. And then I started with the uh, sleep quality. Now, so I'm kind of jumping from one thing to one thing, right, in a specific pattern. So energy, sleep quality, improved sleep, lower stress, and then getting into uh, the blood pressure hiking up as a result of the core glucose control, right? So that's why I'm getting into insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance, and then talking about the supplementation. And the reason why I'm talking about the supplementation because it's the easiest thing to talk about aside from food. Let me catch up with y'all in these comments here. Folks, like the stream. If you like the stream, click that like button. Drop kick the like button, as they say. Uh, if, you, uh, if, if you like the, the, the information I'm putting down here. Dedicated for life. Good to see you in here. Plant-based wife. Hello. My boo-boo. Forever faithful. Good to see you. F faithful unto him. All right. <laughs> I'm, used to, I'm used to seeing my happy health thing. Everybody give a big shout out to my boo-boo in the stream, my lady. My happy health thing. Um... 
Learning something new, share this live with your friends. True. What me what magnesium brand do you do you recommend? Okay. So I'll talk about that a little bit, right? Um typically the magnesium that I've grown to really like is a magnesium by uh, a company named Thorn. Um the, the main reason why is because people really like the taste, so it's easier to drink. <laughs> um, it's good quality. You know, they've got legit, like, third-party testing and whatnot um, that they do. And so third-party testing is really important. Testing for uh, impurities, heavy metals, things of that nature. That's extremely important to test for. Uh, so those are things that I look for. Um... I don't really deviate a whole lot and try out a whole bunch of different like supplement companies. I'm not even really necessarily that big on supplements, right? Um, I got to see a lot of research and scientific evidence on on um, different supplements as far as the efficacy, because there's no shortage of different supplements that you can take. So, you know, the magnesium biglycinate uh, by by Thorn. Um, People are very particular about taste. I particularly like to get things unflavored and I do it myself. You know, I'll mix things up myself, uh, that kind of thing. But yeah, so that's the one that I that, that I uh, usually tell people about. Right. Um, and getting it in a powder form. If you get it in capsule form, you're just gonna have to swallow like three or four capsules. With the powder, you can do like a one teaspoon of it and that one teaspoon will get you 200 and change as far as milligrams, right? 220, 240 milligrams, something like that. You need roughly 400 or 420 milligrams per day. You don't need to rely on supplementation for um, all of your magnesium because you should be on a magnesium rich diet. Okay, so like when I structure a diet plan for people, especially dealing with chronic illness, their diet is like six, even 700 milligrams at least of magnesium per day, right? So like, for example, if you wanted to get like 500 milligrams of magnesium per day, here's the blueprint, for example, or here's one option. One cantaloupe, four bananas, a quarter cup of roasted pumpkin seed kernels, and four cups of pulled kale. That'll get you 490 to 500 milligrams of magnesium. So then when you supplement with the magnesium uh, glycinate or biglycinate at night, right, you get even more magnesium in addition to that. So you may say, well, do well, if I'm getting all of the magnesium I need for my diet, should I be supplementing with it? You don't need to, but it's very advantageous to do so. The reason why that is, um, is because if you're dealing with gut health issues, maybe you're experiencing a lot of gas and bloating and constipation, or, you know, you've lacked the necessary gut flora, things like that. You, you've had a magnesium deficiency for a very long period of time. Um, in that case, it would be a good idea to supplement because you could probably only be absorbing like half of the magnesium from your food. Magnesium typically stays in your body for 12 to 24 hours, right? So it's not going to stay in your body for a really long time, right? So supplementing with it is a way of guaranteeing that you're getting the necessary magnesium. And mind you, that 400 milligrams per day, it's a minimum. It's not necessarily the goal, it's a minimum. All right. Um, you could be getting like a gram of magnesium a day. And that would probably even be optimal. Of course, that can be difficult for a lot of people to do who are not used to eating an abundance of, you know, fiber and food and all that kind of stuff. As a raw vegan or whatever, yeah, you could definitely get that. With all, especially, you know, a bunch of fruit and nuts. Oh, yeah, most certainly you can. Yeah. Um, so let me pick back up. Uh, before I get back on to talking about the other causes, because I'm going to get real thorough about it tonight. Uh, but folks, hit the like button. We got six likes on the stream so far. 
if you haven't lit, hit the like button, if you haven't drop kicked or elbowed the like button, do me a favor and tap that up right quick. I'm going to be doing more of these streams over here on the YouTubes. Don Ann, what's going on? Good to see you here in the stream. Shout out to Boo Boo. <laughs> True. All right. So let me get back on track here. So I talked about the metabolic disorder, the glucose control, the sleep quality, energy production. Now we got to talk about the amino acids and creating vasodilation, improving your blood pressure in real time, as well as maintaining the infrastructure of your vascular system. So your blood vessels, arteries and whatnot need to be soft and smooth and durable. They got to be able to stretch. They got to be able to remain, to be able to maintain some fluidity because if they're too rigid and they get calcified and hardened, well, then they start to develop cracks and then those cracks can then get filled by atherosclerotic plaque deposits. And those atherosclerotic plaque deposits build up over time, calcify your arteries, and then you're locked into a permanent state of vascular constriction and high blood pressure. All right, so that's essentially how that works. So how do you maintain the flexibleness in the in the, the the smoothness of the arteries well a big part of that is potassium potassium helps with the vasodilation the hydration of the body absorbing the necessary amount of uh water inside your cells right so making sure that there's not too much water going in your cells and not too much water leaving your cells so regulating with a two-way street and potassium works in combination in a codependent fashion with sodium. A lot of people think, well, my doctor told me to avoid using salt when I'm cooking because salt drives my pressure up. That's not true. Because sodium doesn't act on its own. Sodium only becomes a problem when there is a deficit of potassium. All of the people who have adverse reactions as far as their blood pressure with sodium, it's not because they're getting too much sodium, it's because they're not getting enough potassium, it's because they're chronically dehydrated with a fatty diet. Right? So, if you have a, a, a salty diet, if you have a high sodium diet, it is because number one, you're eating processed foods. And number two, you're cooking with oil. And number three, you have a substantial amount of saturated fat and or cholesterol in your diet. It's not just one thing. You gotta have more of a broad based view. Let me give you an example. Anything come in a box, some type of noodles, ketchup out the jar or the bottle, jam, nut butter, whatever the case is. They got to add preservatives to it. Those preservatives based in sodium. That is going to substantially drive up the amount of dietary sodium you're getting. This isn't food. This isn't like sea salt that you're adding to your food while you're cooking. Oh, a teaspoon, a pinch. A little bit of this going on here, this, this sprinkling here, that's, that's not going to get you uh, high, high blood pressure from too much salt. It's the preservatives embedded in the food. Then the fat content of your food, right? Let's say if you're eating meat, something like that, chicken, breast, beef, whatever the case is, and you're cooking it, it's all this fat and whatnot in the pan or the pot. And then you're adding butter or olive oil or avocado oil, whatever kind of oil. The oil is fat and then there's fat in the meat. And it's just a whole bunch, it's a stew of fat. 
And then if you add sodium to that, well, now you have a bunch of fat and sodium. This is very dehydrating. So if you're eating foods and your foods are dehydrating, and then you have an abundance of sodium from processed foods as well as added foods um, when you're cooking, uh, added sodium in the foods when you're cooking, this is a recipe for high blood pressure. Literally dietary saturated fat, oil, cholesterol, salt, or just sodium and preservatives. Great recipe for high blood pressure, right? So when you're making your soul food, you're doing your fried fish, whatever the case is, shrimp, crab, right? Mashed potatoes, adding butter and salt to the mashed potatoes. You're getting dehydrated and dehydration is one of the leading causes of high blood pressure. So with all that fat, where does that fat go? Fat enter, empties into your bloodstream in the form of lipids, right? So you get all these lipoproteins and whatnot, lipids floating around in your bloodstream, right? And so you develop a saturation of fat in your blood. That fat has to be pulled from your blood, otherwise your blood will thicken up to the point where you get a heart attack. So your liver has to pull fat from your blood, right? So this is gonna be this right here on a repeated basis gradually increases your risk of fatty liver disease over time. Your triglycerides start to tick up, fat, uh, liver enzymes start to tick up, right? And then your, your gallbladder is releasing uh, more acid into your stomach to break down all the fats, right? So this whole thing just gets ramped up. And as that process gets ramped up, you get more and more dehydrated and you get higher and higher blood pressure. And then of course, you also gain weight <laughs> as well. You start storing more fat in your liver, storing more fat on top of your organs in the form of visceral fat, storing more subcutaneous fat underneath your skin, storing more lipids inside your lean tissue cells, therefore making you more insulin resistant. And then, of course, fat and water, uh, they don't mix very well. Uh, fat is hydrophobic. And so, basically, you have this zero-sum game between excess fat and water, right? And so then you develop a swelling in the hands and feet, lower legs. You get poor circulation uh, in your lower legs, edema, right? And then, eventually, neuropathy, gout, etc., that's when this stuff really gets out of hand. And this usually happens around 45, 50, 55, 60 years old. But this is like decades in the making. All right, so I'm just telling you eventually what it leads to. But before you experience all the other things, the edema and the neuropathy and the diabetes and the fatty liver and the kidney disease, and kidney disease is like, it's one of the later stage things. If you've developed kidney disease, you've developed all the other stuff first. Right. High blood pressure is one of the first indicators. So this is what I mean about um, high blood pressure being an indicator. It's not, it's not really much of a disease in and of itself. It's an indicator. It's a reaction that your body has to let you know you're having blood flow issues. Before I move on to food, because I'm kind of talking about food when I start getting into saturated fat and all this type of stuff, before I get into that, was it, there are... There are... Two... Yeah, two supplements that I want to talk about. I was kind of thinking three, but it's two. Citrulline, beta-alanine. Now you can get citra out. You can get citrulline from foods, and citrulline converts into arginine. Arginine create, is used in the body to create nitric oxide, which dilates your vascular system. Right, opens up your blood vessels. You can actually get citrulline um, as a supplement. I particularly advocate for 
citrulline malate and use it as a pre-workout supplement. Beta alanine is a type of amino acid that your body makes on its own, but you can supplement with it. Right, so you can supplement with like, what's it, like three, three grams a day, somewhere around there? Four, maybe? Citrulline is around like three to six mill, uh, three to six grams per day. So the reason why I say citrulline malate is citrulline paired to malic acid. Malic acid uh, is very important for ATP production inside your mitochondria. Remember that thing I was talking about with the B with the B12 and the glucose regulation to convert uh, glucose inside your cells into ATP, the adenosine triphosphate thing that I was talking about earlier. Yeah, so that malic acid plays a large role in that. When you bind that malic acid to citrulline, it becomes citrulline malate. Absorbs very well, has a nice tangy flavor, similar to like lemon or lime. Um, and that acts as a precursor to create more nitric oxide to dilate your vascular system. Very popular in the bodybuilding community, you got pre-workouts, and pre-workouts do this. They have caffeine in them, B vitamins, vitamin C, uh, and citrulline, creatine, and beta alanine, right? Citrulline is one of those things. Um, I don't really advise people to take a pre-workout because they come with like 250 milligrams of, mag uh, of caffeine usually, and people usually don't need more caffeine. I'm never really ever gonna suggest to somebody to actually supplement with caffeine, right? So rather than get the whole pre-packaged, pre-workout, you could just get the citrulline malate on its own and put that in your water, a little bit of liquid stevia if you want some sweetness to create a lemonade or a limeade, and then boom, you drink that like an hour to two hours before exercise. And that, and that works to lower your blood pressure as well. It also gives you a nice boost during your workouts. Beta alanine. Beta alanine goes a long way towards regulating acid buildup inside your muscle tissue or your lean tissue cells in general, which creates for more stamina and more ATP production due to the recycling of acid into new energy. Right? So when you use ATP, it converts into ADP, right? Or some AMP. Which is ADP is adenosine diphosphate. It loses one of the phosphates. So adenosine diphosphate or aden adenosine monophosphate, right, where it loses two <laughs> right, of the phosphates. And there has to be a recycling process where you then get the ATP again, right? Um, and so this beta alanine helps with stamina and better energy production, better glucose usage and acid regulation and cycling, right? Uh, so beta alanine is very good for that. It's also very good for brain chemistry, and there's also a bunch of scientific data that shows that it's very good for uh, anxiety and depression, similar to how magnesium is, similar to how vitamin D are, right? These things all work together to improve uh, your brain chemistry, right? Uh, so citrulline malate and beta alanine. And you can combine them together in water. Beta alanine, you can get it unflavored. You don't even realize it's in your water. It doesn't have a taste. Citrulline malate has a taste. It's tangy, right? Like lime juice. So you can put those in your water and you drink them, you know, like an hour or so before your workout. And it goes a long way towards getting you through your workout with an abundance of energy. You can really push through and give it, you know, that, that extra, those extra percentage points, that extra 5 or 10% of effort in your workouts, right? Now, I was going to add creatine as number three, since we're talking about pre-workouts. Creatine um, is made from uh, three different uh, amino acids, right? Um, I always forget the three. It's either cysteine, histamine, and methionine. I think those are the three. Um, I'm going to have to go and fact check myself another time, but... Um, is three of these amino acids compared to get combined together to make creatine. Your body makes its own creatine, um, but there's a lot of scientific data that shows uh, that you can um, significantly improve 
your overall health supplementing with creatine. It does this in a variety of ways. Creatine basically uh, gets stored inside your muscle tissue and helps also to convert more ATP um, inside your muscle tissue, right? Convert more glucose into ATP inside your muscle tissue. So this is great for sports performance, building muscle, that type of thing, as far as increasing strength output. But it also helps to improve glucose absorption in your brain and regulate brain chemistry, okay? Um, creatine can help to prevent neurodegenerative disease. So people of all ages um, can benefit from creatine. Diabetics, um, people with neurodegenerative diseases, people with neuropathy, for example, any kind of nerve damage, creatine is very good for that. So um, regulating brain chemistry, improving glucose uptake and energy conversion inside your cells, creatine is very good for that. As well as muscle mass preservation. So this is a very important supplement for somebody, for people who are like, let's say, past the age of 40 or past the age of 45. Creatine supplementation is a good idea. It's not really directly going to affect your, your blood pressure. It can work along with other things to improve your blood pressure, but it, I wouldn't really regard it as like a supplement for your blood pressure, right? Um, so if you're interested in taking creatine as a supplement, I would recommend five grams a day on average should be enough and you know creatine monohydrate is typically uh the one that i the, the one that i take and the one that i suggest very affordable very cheap uh it's pretty easy to get a good quality creatine monohydrate before i go into some more complicated stuff <laughs> let me take a pause and just say uh you know Welcome everybody for joining and watching currently. If you haven't touched the, the like button, definitely tap the like button. That's what, that's what everybody on the Facebooks does. They like tap the like button, smash the like button, drop kick the like button. What do they say? Slam the like button, body slam the like button. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely tap the like button if you if you're getting a lot of uh, value out of the stream tonight I'm giving out a lot of uh, Life-changing information here Let me catch up with some of y'all in the comments here I feel you I had better energy in June While mostly fruitarian still energetic, but not quite as much since the injury and got a bit behind on walking, on working out. Ah, uh. yeah, D. We're gonna we're gonna chop it up tomorrow. We're gonna we're gonna see if we can make any adjustments here. Past the age of fifty-five, what creatine for me? Oh yeah, creatine monohydrate. I need the energy, even if I want to work out. Dedicated for life. You get you got to touch base with me. You got to book a call with me. We got to talk about your stuff here. We got to. You got low energy, okay? Low energy is not a good sign, all right? You, you're lacking on the currency, on the currency of life, right? So we got to talk about that. So all that food I ate <laughs> when I was younger caused all the issues I had as an older adult. <laughs> it, yeah, people eat themselves into the grave, let me tell you. Aurelia Latrice. I like the name Latrice. This is so helpful. That's, that's the goal, to be helpful. Paying it forward. Your first lady announced and I got here. Oh, yeah, I put um in the Discord, I put the, uh, the scheduled event in advance. Uh, I also sent out an email to everybody on my email list about when I was streaming tonight. So when I book these streams, you know, I try to let everybody know in advance. Um, that I'm going to be streaming and what time I'm going to be streaming. Sandra, a lot of information overload, but good information. Definitely have to see this again. Yeah, it's a lot. It is a lot. It's a lot of information. That is true. 
Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll have the replay up. Uh, you know, look, I've got decades of energy of information here <laughs> and trying to cram it into the stream. So, yeah, I mean, I could go a little bit over. I try to simplify it as much as possible. You know. But, uh, yeah. Now, let me, let, let me catch back up here, right? Because we talked about the things that dilate your vascular system. Aside from supplementation, we had to talk about staying hydrated. Now, here's where we get into food. Because a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I stay hydrated. I drink a gallon of water a day. It's not how much you, it's not how much water you drink, it's how much water is stored in your cells. It's how much water you hold on to. If you just drink a bunch of water and it's sending you to the bathroom, they're going to just urinating like crazy. Well, that's not a great way of staying hydrated. That is a great way of losing a lot of electrolytes and minerals and vitamins in general. So you end up urinating out all your vitamin C and B vitamins and losing a bunch of magnesium and potassium and whatnot uh, in your urine. Right. Um, so not particularly a good idea just drinking a ton of water. By the way, like, I notice when I eat cooked food, I feel way more thirsty than normal. This is why, like, I'm, I've become very accustomed to just having the bulk of my diet just be fruit. I just eat fruit all day. Because cooked food feels heavy and dehydrating. Don't get me wrong, cooked food is a ton of nutrients, right? It has its place. But when you go day in and day out and you're just eating like fruits and nuts and some leafy greens, it's a world of difference. You don't feel dehydrated, you know. But as far as hydration goes, right? Having a diet in a, that is abundant in fruit. This is... When you're eating 10, 15, 20 servings of fruit a day, right? You're having two, three fruit bowls a day. You're eating a bunch of mangoes, bananas, watermelon, apples, grapes, all this type of stuff. These are hydrating foods, right? This is how you really get your water stored up inside your cells, right? The correct way, because your water is infused with carbohydrates, fiber, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, you name it, antioxidants, all this stuff, right? Well, your water isn't infused with fiber. It would probably be your fibers infused with water, but you know what I mean. So this is a massive game changer in anybody's diet. I've had the most results with reversing chronic illness or getting people to reverse their chronic illnesses uh, with a largely fruit-based diet where, where the main food group is fruit. Massive game changer, okay? You don't have to worry about being dehydrated because when you sit down and you eat a meal, you're going to be getting an, abund an abundance of water doing that. You don't got to worry about drinking all kind of extra water. You're getting a lot of it from your food. Pears, apples, pineapple, grapes, blueberries, strawberries, kiwis, right? Cucumbers, watermelon, cantaloupe, honeydew, right? And then you actually, you get a lot of your zinc and your magnesium from your almonds, cashews, chia seeds, pumpkin seed kernels, the roasted pumpkin seed kernels, sunflower seed kernels, hemp seeds, flax seeds, right your coconut yogurt all these types of things your avocado right so that's where you're getting all those minerals from and those type of things so i mean honestly your diet could just be straight up just fruits and nuts all day as far as the foods are concerned staying hydrated i would say that's like number two in the top three of most important things. Number one, I would say sleep quality. Number two, I would say stay high, staying hydrated. And number three, I would say the foods that you eat. There's a very big difference between eating nut butters and eating nuts. So for example, eating whole peanuts or whole almonds rather than eating almond butter or peanut butter. Uh, 
one is more dehydrating and one ain't really dehydrating at all. Especially if you're having it with the fruit. Even in your nuts, let's say you eat a cup of nuts and that cup of nuts is like 680 to 720 calories. You say, well, that's a lot of calories. This ain't gonna make me gain weight. Not necessarily because it's like 25% of the caloric value coming from the fats inside your nuts, inside your nuts, inside uh, the nuts you're eating. Um, you're not, a, you're not, di you're not absorbing that. 25% of the dietary fat from nuts don't get absorbed right? because it's regulated by uh, the fiber. Right? Uh, so, th so it's a self-regulating food. You, you don't really get fat from eating, you know, almonds or anything like that. Right now, of course, that doesn't mean that you buy a whole, you know, two pound bag or something like that. And you just eat them in a compulsive fashion until your fingertips touch the bottom of the bag, right? I'm not saying that, obviously. You gotta be calculated, <laughs> right? You gotta know when enough is enough because you can binge eat them because they're not, you know, again, they're tight. And they're not water rich. And the thing is with fruits, the reason why you can't necessarily binge eat fruits is because number one, the glucose content and number two, the water content and the fiber content. All that water and fiber will fill you up and then all the extra carbs is satiating. Right? So it's a self-regulating food in that way. That's why I say, you know, you polish off your fruits and then you have your side of nuts uh, afterwards. Right? And that's typically uh, the recommendation there as far as uh, a raw vegan diet. If you're trying to regulate your blood pressure, raw vegan diet abundance and abundant in fruits nuts and seeds leafy green vegetables along with the supplements that i that i mentioned on the stream tonight those things collectively will significantly improve your life your quality of health your blood flow your blood pressure when we talk about blood pressure we don't just want to fix or improve blood pressure. We want to fix and improve blood pressure, blood flow, and blood quality. Right, I made a video about this a while back. I'll probably touch on it again because the sound quality was a bit not so great. I'm, I'm learning how to become a sound engineer. <laughs> Adding that skill to the skill set. But yeah, those three things, blood pressure, blood flow, blood quality. Right? Blood quality, you need adequate amounts of vitamin C, B vitamins, iron, copper, zinc, all of that. Your blood should be well hydrated, good blood plasma, right amount of red blood cells where you got a good amount of hemoglobin, but it's not too excessively high because then you end up getting thick blood and you don't want too many white blood cells because when your white blood counts, when your white blood cell count is is excessively elevated that can lead to autoimmune disorders so you need everything to be regulated just right and the human body does a very good job of tightly regulating itself given you have the right nutrition right. um and so that's why I like the foods and stuff is important so that raw vegan diet comprised of the foods i just mentioned um as well as your supplements that i just mentioned and achieving that good deep quality sleep those things right there that's the key to improving your blood pressure last but not least we're talking about exercise exercise does not need to be extremely intense this is going to be the last thing i touch on your exercise doesn't need to be extremely intense and you know what honestly it shouldn't be extremely intense either because if your exercise is too intense you end up getting a heart attack Okay, because that intensity can create pressure. And when you're out of breath, because you're in an anaerobic state, because you're crushing yourself during your workout, that can drop your pH level a bit too low. And then you get lightheaded, you want to lie down on the floor and pass out. And then you catch your breath and your alkalinity, your pH balance shoots back up probably to like a 7.6 or something. <laughs> 
And then you get the endorphin rush, the high, you, you get in this euphoric state, and then you come back down to like your 7.4. <laughs> right. I'm not going to get a whole lot into alkalinity right now, but that's kind of what happens, right? So you want to be balanced. Your intensity and your exercise should be somewhere in between a 6 and 8.5 and as far as intensity on a scale of 1 to 10. So 60%. 85% max is a good threshold for where you should spend most of your time in your workout. If you're doing resistance training, this is more easy to calculate. Right, so whatever weight you're using, typically, let's say, um, if you're doing sets of 10, you should probably be using a weight that you can get a maximum rep range of like 15 with or 14 or something like that, or 12, something like that, where you're leaving two to four reps in the tank. Right? You don't want to be taking each set to like failure. Right? If you're dealing with all type of elevated blood pressure. Right? When you get your blood pressure to a really decent level and you improve your insulin sensitivity and all of that type of stuff, and you get the healthier you get, the more you can push yourself as far as your exercise, because this is about stress management. Your body's already extremely stressed out, which is the reason why your blood pressure is high in the first place using your workout stressing yourself out all you're doing is tacking on more stress you work out too hard they can harm your sleep quality so then you end up getting worse sleep quality because you're working out way too hard and if you're trying to lose weight because you're obese and with high blood pressure then you end up in a steep food deficit right what they call a steep caloric deficit where you don't really get into a caloric deficit but that's a totally separate conversation um but significantly reducing the amount of food that you eat, running yourself into the ground with your workouts, those things together will crash your sleep quality and then have an adverse reaction where you end up even having even worse blood pressure. And then you get chronic headaches, depression, lack of motivation, anxiety, worsening blood chemistry, etc. Right? That's why you don't want to push yourself too hard. So you have yourself in that threshold, right? At 60 to 85% of your intensity. And that's pretty much what I would say about exercise at that point. I think I covered everything I wanted to cover tonight. I think that's, that's the bulk of it right there. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I'll wait for some questions to come through if y'all got any questions for me. And then after that, I'm going to be logging off here. And I think we got through it. If you haven't uh, hit the like button on the stream, definitely uh, gently s smash the like button. <laughs> Dennis with a Z at the end. I like that spelling of that name. Doesn't eating animal hearts help? <laughs> I don't know about all of that. No. That sounds gross. It sounds expensive, too. I don't know. <laughs> that doesn't seem to be like a, log like a logistical... That doesn't seem to be a logistically wise thing. Uh, so, yeah, I wouldn't recommend... Uh, eating hearts and organs and stuff. It seems, very, it seems like very expensive. It's really cheap. All right, I mean, <laughs> that's what you want to do. Um, I'd rather just eat some mangoes and some pineapple or something like that. But for whatever reason, you know, people still have like uh, desires to have some relatively weird dietary choices. But anyways, um... I'm going to call it a night, y'all, and uh, stay tuned for the next live stream.